Well, good morning, everybody. Happy to be with you. And uh, I'm excited about this uh, BC Knowledge Exchange. Uh, I'm wearing, I'm not wearing, I've got my hat back in the late 90s, early 2000s. We used to do this uh, information exchange between uh, Forest Service practitioners and folks in BC. And we'd kind of go up, I think the, the regular scheme was we'd show up up there for a week or so in the winter everyone president would share their presentations their projects they're working on and kind of give each other feedback we would kind of critique each other help each other etc and then in the summer we would actually go visit each other's projects back and forth on each side of the of the border so it was super awesome really really good stuff um so i'm a fisheries biologist paul powers um You'll, you'll notice in my talks that I will shamelessly wander out of my lane and pretend to be a hydrologist from time to time, pretend to know some geomorph stuff. So I apologize ahead of time, but those were some fantastic presentations from Janine and Colin, known these two forever. And, and part of the learning and evolution that Janine hit on so well is the sharing of our projects with each other, walking the, the ground with each other and, and not just showing each other the stuff that we're proud of and we think worked out really well, but the, the things that didn't go the way we expected and, and they turn into those happy accidents if, we're, if we evaluate them critically and, and try to figure out what happened and why and, and swim with the current rather than against it. So, and Janine's been a huge part of that over my career. So I wanted to say thank you to her. Okay, so what I'm gonna try to do in this presentation is kind of take you through how we're evaluating landscapes now and how do we, we, we call it taking off our channel goggles where we're channel centric and we're thinking about the habitats within this channel that you see to having more of a, a valley goggles and jumping out of that channel and understanding the, the processes that built the environment that we're trying to work in. And if we can understand that and untangle that, then we can come up with a restoration scheme that, that might work with those valley scale processes to restore this. So this first picture I've got on the, the slide here is a great example of, of doing just that. This is a site, this photo actually is from about 25, 27 years. And the first time I, I got a chance to work on this meadow and probably 95, at least 95% of the projects I've ever worked on start with a scene just like this. It's that eroding outside bank that's just so egregious to people. And, and our initial response is we want to stop that lateral migration, right? And so back then we were, you know, you can see the survey equipment, you jump in, you start surveying the habitats and, and we're trying to de design something, a pattern profile dimension that would restore this site and, and provide better salmon habitat. So now getting a chance to come back to this project site all these years later and look at this from a different perspective, um, my view on this and how we would actually restore this is vastly different. So I'll, I'll start using this as an example. And so before I get into that, though, the, the presentation is supposed to be about how do you find response type valleys. And I'll just point you to there are some products out there already that you can go to. The Valley Confinement Algorithm out of Rocky Mountain Research Station is a nice product built on 10 meter DEMs and it you know, it will map fairly coarsely, but pretty accurately where we have depositional valley types versus non-depositional valley types. There's other products. This is from the, the Beachy and Amaki paper in 2014, also using 10 meter DEMs for the entire Columbia Basin. But taking that uh, valley confinement a step further and, and kind of predicting what we would expect to see for channel plan form. And so they, they broke things into four separate classes where you have either confined, straight, anabranching, or meandering channels is where, what you would expect to find on these different things. So this is all GIS based. You can grab these products from either the VCA or the, uh, the channel prediction and, and plot those up and see how those match with your particular valleys. But what we want to do is get a little bit sharper resolution than that. We want to dive into a particular project and, and try to untangle it and, and make sense of why it's degraded in the first place and then see if we can figure out how to restore it. And, and I will mention, you know, my first picture here, I've, I've got the LiDAR on. So that's been a huge advancement in, in the way we can evaluate landscapes. 25 years ago when I was at that scene in the top right corner, 
that didn't exist. And, and so I'm going to use that as an excuse for why we were a bit channel centric. So the photo that you see there was taken uh, where that yellow circle is with the, the red X in it. And flow is moving from left to right. Um, so to understand this valley and to figure out where the, you know, where the depositional valleys are within this landscape, this, this example might be fairly straightforward. We can see that it's pretty broad and unconfined like Colin was sharing with us. Confinement can be a pretty easy indicator of that. But we want to take it a step further. So what I'm going to do here in GIS is just snap a, a center line, you know, not following the channel or anything, but just between the toe slopes up through these uh, river segments. And if I plot that out, this is the way that bare earth LIDAR will plot out. And so you can see that we have a, a pretty distinct hinge point and, and the arrows there show you where on the profile and then where that sits on the ground. And so downstream on the left there, we have a fairly high gradient spot and then upstream is very low gradient and that's gonna be our depositional spot. This is what we refer to as the, the geomorphic control. This is really the focus of most of our restoration now is finding this location and understanding both why it's there and how it functions. So I'll step you through kind of how we're interpreting that and, and how we make sense of it and then how we're gonna use it later in a design. So if we zoom into that location, you'll see that there's, um, on the left side of the screen, there's a couple pattern uh, streams flowing to the left. And then right in the center, we have a stream, excuse me, a road that goes north-south. And so what we're gonna do is all the flow is in that channel to the north on this slide. I'm gonna walk you down the road. We'll jump into the stream and show you what that looks like. If I point the camera at my toes, this is what the riverbed looks like. It's pretty large substrates, uh, mostly large cobble, some small boulder stuff, but I'm also seeing a lot of moss uh, growing on the substrates. So right away, my impression of this particular spot is that this is a very stable environment, right? We're not getting a lot of turnover of this bed. It's, it's, it's staying in position long enough that it's growing these mosses. If I tip my head up and look upstream a little bit, I'm noticing that the riparian forest is right up against the edges of the stream here. Um, it's a conifer forest. Again, I see large substrates in the stream bed and we've got the mosses. Again, that looks quite stable. We've got a really nice looking log jam. So I'm getting some impressions of what this area is behaving like. If I look at the left bank of this channel, this is what we're seeing. So again, very similar to what the the substrates in the stream are like. It's quite large, um, very unsorted. You know, it's pretty good size, large particles. If I keep walking upstream, and as soon as I pass that hinge point that I showed you in the profile where that geomorphic control is, if you look really closely, there's a subtle difference in particle size, right? We go from that very large, irregular stuff to now we're in very fine-grained materials and ash, in both the bed and the banks of the channel. So why is this the condition? This is what I think we have going on here. And this will be familiar for a lot of folks in Canada. I stole this image off of Google. But what we have here is a stream flowing away from us. And coming off the left of the side of this image is there's a glacier coming across the valley and creating an impoundment and, and creating that depositional environment headward on this stream that's in the foreground. So I think that's the same situation we had going on on desolation. So the depositional valley of interest is gonna be the North Fork desolation flowing away from us. And on the left side of the screen there, you can see I've drawn in a cartoon on South Fork desolation of where I think a glacier occupied that valley, came across the North Fork desolation valley, creating this impoundment. And then as years go by, the climate starts to warm, our glacier starts to recede, but I'm leaving my glacier footprint, the lateral and terminal moraines there on, on the screen so you can see where those are, which very much coincides where that geomorphic control is. Now, as that glacier recedes out, now that the impoundment mechanism is removed and then this stream can start to outflow. And so you can see that light blue channel there starts to flow. Time goes by, this glacier melts a little bit more, 
exposing more flow paths lower in elevation on that you know glacier bowl face and then as time continues to go on that glacier is fully melted out now we have the south fork stream flows through there but the remnants of that glacier still impacted the way this the, flu, the fluvial processes within this valley so i'm going to spin you around and show you that same view from from the south fork perspective and so here we are on the South Fork, looking north to where it's going to intersect with the North Fork Desolation. And I, and I like these views in a little bit of 3D exaggeration, but you can see that, that ridge on the, on the right side of South Fork Desolation Creek. You can almost envision just a bulldozer pushing and, and the material spilling off the side of the blade. That's kind of exactly what you're getting with this glacier effect. So that those large glacial particles is what's creating that geomorphic control. And I'm going to highlight a couple of things for you. Those, those black striations, you can just see the different elevations where that glacier was at as it was receding and melting back. And right now you can, in this image, all flow is in that light blue stream channel at the, at the upper elevation in this picture. And then those dark blue channels at the bottom they're not flowing at all. So to me, uh, as a simple guy, that, that seems pretty curious. Uh, as far as what I know about gravity, it typically usually puts water in the lowest of the lowest elevations, and that's not going on in this case. So I find that kind of interesting. All right, so I told you geomorphic controls are super critical to these depositional valleys. So I think we found where the geomorphic control for desolation is. Now the question becomes, if that's the control, why is it no longer controlling? Why do we have a transport channel moving through a depositional valley? So let's jump back into that location and see if we can figure this out. So here we are, and again, all flow is in that channel to the north, which is the higher elevation channel, and by several meters, quite a bit. So that's curious, right? So how did it get that way, and, and what does it mean? So to untangle this, I think sometimes it helps to put yourselves in the shoes of the person or people who came here and were trying to extract resources. Say you're the person responsible for building that road. If you have to build multiple roads across that outflow, that's pain, right? It takes more time, it takes more resources, more money, it delays everything. So you've got a tried and true method that's been used many, many, many times around the world. You've got your heavy equipment in there already for building the road. So what you do is you have them jump down in there as well. And I'm going to draw a little cartoon where I think this happened. But you have them cut out that geomorphic control. I'll, I'll reverse that so you can see it without my, uh, my black markings in there. But you'll see that uniform width, width of a dozer, and really straight things. So I think they cut material out of here lowering our base elevation, spoiled material right there on the left and where this red is piled up, and then continued cutting a channel through here. So now they've accomplished, from their perspective, a couple of things that are really beneficial for them. They have one stream crossing instead of multiples, and they've pulled the drain plug out of that depositional valley headward, and Janine hit on this in her presentation. We, we think about the substrates that are involved here the geomorphic control is very hard, that glacier material, not erodible by the stream, versus the depositional valley headward, that's all that really fine grain material and ashes and things. And once we lower this base elevation control, we've created a lot of uh, hydraulic head, and then we send a head cut moving back up through that meadow, creating that incision that we see today. And then that red berm, that's, that's that image I showed you before of the left bank. So not only did they channelize this stream and focus all flow to that one crossing, they also blocked off those flow paths to the south so they didn't have to worry about putting in another crossing over there. And if I climb up on top of that pile, the, the relic flow paths prior to the road going in are still there. They're just high and dry and isolated from flow. And so this is kind of how we look at this scene now and in restoration of this this scene on the top right that I'm showing you here. Now, my impression of this is that it relies entirely 
on reconstructing that geomorphic control down here where it had been artificially removed. So in practice, what we'd be doing is, is taking this side cast berm material and putting it back in place and, and lifting that elevation back up. Now, once that's in place, then we've got a lot of options available to us as far as how do we actually restore the wet meadow. And, and Jared and Damien will share some examples too that would be very, very applicable on this landscape. Let's look at another setting in a, in a glacial valley. So we're just south of the Canadian border right here. This is um, the Chihuahua River, which is flowing from the northwest to the southeast in this image. Again, I think this valley was occupied by a glacier. <clears throat> Excuse me. Similarly, the glacier melts out over time. So I've left the, the dotted line there where I think the glacier basically occupied in this area. And something I want to point out while this slide is up is you'll see a tributary with a little blue arrow that comes in from the north and is going to go right along that, that left edge of that lateral moraine. And then the confluence is going to be right there at the terminal moraine with the Chihuahua. So we want to do the same thing. We want to run a simple profile through this valley and then profile that out and see how things look. And so similarly, I'm showing you here in blue on, on the profile, we've got a long depositional valley coming through that glacier valley where the Chihuahua is. And then where this red part pokes up here, that's where the valley breaks. And, and so that geomorphic control is again going to be in that transition zone between the blue and the red. So our depositional valley will be the blue part upstream on that, on that profile. So let's zoom into that location and see where that is. It's right where this arrow is pointing to, which is not where our terminal moraine was, right? So that's curious, why is that not where it is? It's where I would have expected it to be. So let's zoom in and take a closer look. The location again, right there at the arrow, the footprint of the glacier that I drew in there quickly occupies what we see here in blue. And again, that tributary was flowing on the backside of the lateral moraine and the confluence is downstream. Now, if I take that away, what you, probably, you guys can probably already see in this, in this LIDAR hillshade imagery is that lateral moraine on the left side is intact for a spot, but then there's a piece missing. So I think what we had happen was that that tributary eventually impounded or it caused, somehow it caused that lateral moraine to fail. And then we get this big episodic pulse slide of all that glacier material in, which is going to be very coarse, very large material, not the fluvial substrates of the Chihuahua River, but this much larger non-erodible material. So flowing down and impounding against the Chihuahua and, and pushing that against the opposite wall. So there's that same location. Now, again, if this was a control, why is it no longer functioning? Again, we had the same kind of breach, manual lowering of that, the geomorphic control. So I'll just show you a couple more views in this with uh, some 3D renderings that kind of, I think when you can look at it and, and increase this um, vertical exaggeration, it really makes these things pretty sharp and clear. I've also got an REM painted into that um, Chihuahua River Valley. And, and don't worry about the specifics right now, other than that the pinks are basically going to show us the lowest elevations in this particular valley. And then the, the oranges are going to be the higher elevations. So if we're looking down, flow is moving away from us in this uh, photo here. And so we can see where that occupied really nice sharp edges along both sides. And then towards the uh, up on there, you can see where that where that lateral moraine has failed and all that material out into the Chihuahua Valley. Zoom in on that a little bit closer for you. So I think when you can, when you put the, the landscape scale and the valley scale into context like that, that really helps us for shaping our restoration plan for this. If we understand how that Chihuahua Valley formed upstream and why, now we can start to put together a, a design for how to get it restored. All right, let's show you one more example from an entirely different setting. So these are my good friends, Colin Thorne in the black jacket, 
Ben Eardley in the blue jacket. We're in Southwest England now. And just like those other spots, like, like I said, 95% of the projects we visit, it's because of an eroding bank. So Ben takes us on a walk down the river Ala, and he's got this spot that he wants to know, well, how can we fix this spot? And so I'm gonna kind of go through the same practice with you. First of all, looking at this image, are we in a depositional valley? Uh, looking at it, you know, my initial impressions are, yes, it, it seems to be we're not confined at all, right? We have pretty broad expanse, a large floodplain on both sides. But if we're channel centric right here and, and we're just in the channel, it's hard to gain that context for the larger setting. So what I'm gonna do is zoom out again and we'll look at the LIDAR imagery and try to make sense of this landscape. And I'm cheating here a little bit. The geomorphic control is still further downstream. It's off the page and I didn't really wanna focus on that for this particular spot, but instead I wanted to give you some local context. You could see that this is a pretty broad valley and being in England, as Colin mentioned in his presentation, you know that the, the disturbance history is quite old and the manipulation of flow is quite old. It's been going on for quite some time. So let's zoom in on that a little bit closer so you can see some of those manipulations. And I'll point out some, some features that I think are important to untangling uh, this story. So the River Ala, this is its channel in blue and it's flowing to the northwest direction there. We have a tributary coming in out of the south at that blue arrow. And if you look at the LIDAR, you can see that that's been clearly channelized and straightened. Another feature on here is we've got, again, a road going across our valley and, and the river all is gonna cross this thing. So here's that same scene with an REM painted on it. And again, we'll get into the specifics of REM and how to make them I mean, later, but for right now, really all that's important and what I want you to see is that the pink is the lowest elevation within this valley. And then the, the greens, yellows, and oranges, those are getting higher in elevation as we move up through the color scheme. I, I put that constricted valley segment in there just to, to kind of speak to what Colin was mentioning this morning about the ribbons and beads on a string. So in, in our, if we were thinking of this as beads on the string, you might look at this particular valley as two distinct beads with a, a string connecting them. But I think the ribbon, the ribbon description might be a little more accurate here. Even though the, the valley constricts in that spot where I've got the arrow, we never lose our floodplain and we don't have a break in valley. This is one continuous valley with variable widths of floodplain. So just wanted to point that out. Okay, so now we've got an REM for our valley of interest. And that photo that I showed you is where the red, the circle with the red X in it is. And the river Ala, this is its flow path that I just showed in white. So similar to what we just looked at on the desolation example, this is quite curious, right? The river Ala is not in the lowest elevation within this valley. Now that's strange, and why would that be? Again, here's our road shown in black where it crosses the valley. So remember our desolation example. If, if you're the road engineer and, and that's a wetland, everything that you see in pink and blue, that's, that's really difficult and expensive and time consuming to build you know, a causeway or a bridge or whatever it's gonna be centuries ago across that landscape. So I said, oh, that was a tried and true technique that I showed you at desolation. Well, I believe they used the same set technique here in England long, long ago. If instead they can channelize the River Ala all, all the way to one side of the valley, as been done here, now you can have the stream crossing in one simple small crossing, right? That's much cheaper and easier. And not only that, what they channelized through is the confluence fan of this left bank tributary. So I'll take that away so you can see those elevations. So you see that where the river Ala flows through is in those greens and yellows. So this is again, higher in elevation than the valley floor for the river Ala. That gives them the added benefit when they channelize this of having confining banks to keep that stream within those banks and not slide back out into the valley. And just like desolation, once it's now dry, now that valley floor to valley right is, is available for ag agricultural development. 
So I, I take this, uh, this quote from Tony Brown, his paper in 2018, which is also a really nice one to add to that list Janine shared. But I think this sentence just rings so true for so many of the valleys that I look at. And he says, Anthropocene rivers are largely imprisoned in the banks of their history. And I think that imprisoned is just so sharp and, and accurate. I think we see so many of these rivers and, and we take them at, at face value that that's the way they should be or that's the way they have been without you know, untangling this broader story and understanding how they got that way. I mean, was it through natural processes or were they forced to, to be where they are today? Okay, a couple more slides of this and then I'll carry on. But again, show you uh, just some different views to help you kind of get that visualization of where that sits on the ground. So again, that photo that I showed you, we can see that we are the stream channel is in the, the alluvial fan of the tributary. So my first question when I first showed this slide is, are we in a depositional valley? Is that a floodplain? Well, the short answer is yes, just not that of the River Alla. We are, the River Alla is occupying the floodplain of the tributary. So again, our alignment goes through here. So what does restoration of this site look like? What would we be looking to do now knowing this? Are we trying to just stabilize these eroding banks on that current channel? Or instead, what we would be looking at is recreating that tributary fan. So we'd be lifting those elevations back up to the greens that you see in the REM map. And thereby restoring flow across that surface rather than downstream through it. And then the river Ala would occupy everything that you see to valley right. So in those those blue and pink zones. And so those might look like this, which is dramatically different from the current river channel, right? So you'll, you'll get to see some examples of how to build valleys that look like this when uh, Damien and Jared share their uh, presentations. One more rendering of this, I just put um, some contour lines on there to kind of help visualize you know, the steepness of ground, the localized steepness of areas. But what's really exciting is uh, Ben Eardley and, and friends over there with the National Trust have, have really embraced this and, and climate change preparedness is a big deal across England, trying to attenuate floods and, and use the landscape to, to store water on it again and attenuate those large floods and, and conversely during drought periods. So they are actively working on this. They actually just finished about two weeks ago grading out the high points in this ground and will be restoring connectivity to the valley back in March. So a little clip from the BBC, these guys do amazing work and, and they do a really good job of getting it exposed and, and in the public view over there. So really, really nice work. And with that, I'm gonna wrap things up real early and leave us plenty of time for uh, questions. I rambled through that pretty quickly, so thank you.